Hello, iSpa family, and welcome to Heart of the Matter, a series which brings together luminaries from a variety of fields and backgrounds for in-depth conversations intended to spark thought, discussion, and inspiration in the spa industry and beyond. I'm Patrick Huey, your iSpa board chairman, and this will be a space where we can talk freely about big ideas and issues that matter to us, not only as spa professionals, but also as human beings. Today, we are honored to have the amazing Malik Pentoli join our conversation. Malik is an award-winning actor, author, and activist. He is known for his comedic turns on television, playing Jonathan on NBC's critically acclaimed 30 Rock, one of my favorites, Sanjay on Showtime's Weeds, and Neil on NBC's Whitney. He is the voice of Baljeet on Disney's Phineas and Ferb, and the title voice of Sanjay on Nickelodeon Sanjay and Craig. On stage, he starred opposite Matthew Broderick and Martin Short in Broadway's It's Only a Play, opposite Ed Harris in Good for Auto, and recently completed the Broadway run of Grand Horizons. In October 2019, Malik published his first book, The Best At It. It was named a 2020 Stonewall Honor Book, a 2019 Junior Library Guild selection, a Chicago Public Library Best of the Best Books, and received starred reviews from Kirkus Reviews, Publishers Weekly, and the American Library Association's book list. Drawn from his own experience, the best at it is about a 12-year-old gay Indian American boy coming into his own. Kirkus raved, every character in the story is nuanced. The protagonist's devastatingly honest voice pulls readers deeply into a fast paced journey. And having read the book, I can tell you that is quite true. A longtime advocate for Asian American and Pacific Islander and LGBTQIA communities, Malik was appointed by President Obama to serve on the President's Advisory Commission on AAPIs. During his three year tenure from 2014 to 2017, he spearheaded the launch of an anti bullying campaign, actochange.org, an organization which he continues to chair today. Act to Change is now a national nonprofit dedicated to ending, ending bullying for AAPI youth and fostering a world where all young people can celebrate their differences. Malik received his bachelor's degree in theater from Northwestern University and his master of fine arts from the Yale School of Drama. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I feel like when you read it out like that, it sounds way better <laughs> than it actually is. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> Thank you, Malik, and thank you, and welcome, welcome to iSpa, where we're so glad that you are with us today. And I, and I just, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for writing the best at it. It is such, it's such a fantastic book, and I think, you know, you tackle some big issues in the book. You, you talk about sexism and racism and homophobia, um, some really, really big, heavy topics, but you do it in such a way that isn't alienating to the audience. And I think I think every person who reads the book can identify with Raul, who is the protagonist, with Raul's journey, because we've all felt like we've been the other or the alien. And we've all sort of you know, tried to figure out who we are in this really crazy time that we're in, um, particularly right now. But I, I thank you for that story. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. I really appreciate it. Yeah. You know, and also kind of, you know, it's so interesting because I feel like in a way, I didn't really set out to talk about all those things so specifically. It really was the story of this lead kid, but I realized like in just telling the truth about all these other characters, so many other things came up. You know, I wanted, I wanted his mom to be a strong character who had to deal with also being a woman in the workplace. I wanted uh, these, these, you know, incredible, what, what Rahul calls the auntie squad. These are these amazing, you know, kind of fierce Indian American women who, who end up forming a community around him. And so all these other pieces kind of started to fall into place really by just telling uh, what felt like a truthful story to me. If that makes sense. And and, and you know what was so interesting about the book? It, it really surprised me because, you know, we start off, the book starts off. I'm not going to read the book. If you haven't read the book, it, you must read it. It's, it's a fantastic book. But we start off, and I, and I think the book is going in run, one direction. 
Um, and then you introduce the character of Brent, who is sort of the antagonist to Raul. And I'm like, oh, okay, I, I know, I know what this story is gonna be about. This 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 kid, Raul, is being bullied by this guy, Brent, who's sort of like, you know, everyone's worst nightmare come to life. <laughs> um, but then you insert into the story the sort of familial bullying that happens with Vinay Uncle with the Raul character. And for me, that's when the book really dropped in, is when you, you talk about this idea of, of people being made to feel other from without their community and from within their community. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And you know, like all, all of these characters are completely fictional, but they are based on, you know, people in my own life and my own experience. And I, as a gay man, I had a lot of fear coming out to the Indian American community in a way that um, some of it was unfounded, you know, like later on in life when I finally did that, I, I actually did feel like I was surrounded by so much love and uh, a, a kind of a surprise sort of sense of like, we're no different than the greater community at large. But I think that because, uh, and I'm curious what your experience was like with this too, but, be, you know, for, for me, a big part of my cultural identity was reserved for weekends, you know, it was like at school, I was, you know, quote unquote American. And, and to me as a kid that meant like trying to be more white, I think, you know, whatever that, whatever the construct was of that in my head. And then on the weekends, it was like, we had these pretty large uh, Indian gatherings, you know, we'd celebrate holidays together. Diwali is this weekend, we'd go to Diwali celebrations and like Indian festivals. And, and that community was really insular in a way, but I think that I had a lot of fears around you know, what it, what it would be like to be gay in the Indian American community. And so I wanted to put that into the book um, in, a, in a realistic way. And Vinay Uncle, I think, embodied a lot of those fears for me. You know, he was kind of like, he's kind of like the guy's guy who doesn't recognize Rahul's um, talents and successes. You know, he, he only puts him down for being something that's, uh, that's you know, it, I mean, I think it's funny, but in the book, Vin Ankle has two sons who like all they want to do is like lay on the sofa and grunt at football games, you know, and like Rahul's not that kid. And so he gets compared to that kid and it makes Rahul feel feel bad. Uh, and so, yeah, so so that character um, is definitely based on people in my own life. And, and, and also what was important to me is that at the end of the book, Rahul does have a, a community around him and that includes this Indian community who lift him up and support him. And we don't get to fully see that, but at the very end of the book, we do have the dad kind of say like, don't you worry about Vinay uncle, I, I can take care of him. You know, he may act all tough, but you know what I mean? And so, so yeah, so that, that, that was really important to me. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, you asked me what my experience was like, you know, I, I went to a predominantly white middle school, junior high school, high school, elementary school. And so you do have that kind of duality of existence where there is a life that you lead when you are, you know, in school around your friends who are in that, in that world. And then you go home and there's a, there's a, there's a different type of, the food we eat is different. The music we listen to is different, you know? So, you know, I have, you know, and when you're 12, those things signify for you in a way that don't necessarily matter to you so much when you're, you know, I'm 49. So, you know, you can, you have those balances in place and you understand how to, how to navigate living in two separate worlds. But when you're 12, 13, those, those shifts are monumental. So I, I think that's why I sort of really empathized with Raul's journey because I'm like, oh, I, I've lived that life. Like it was, it was very, very familiar to me. Um, yeah. Yes. I was gonna say that, that's actually so nice to hear. I mean, what I, and, and you know this because we went to the same um, drama school together, but I feel like, you know, we were always taught that the more specific you are, the more universal the story will actually be. And that's, that's what I found with the book is that because I wrote something that felt a specific to me, but also really specific to this character, um, I feel like not only kids of color and certainly not only LGBTQ kids and not only kids, you know, adults are really relating uh, to this lead character because I think we can all see a version of that in in ourselves but i will also say to that point like as a kid i loved books you know and i and i would relate to lead characters but none of the lead characters ever looked like me or none of the lead characters were ever dealing with being lgbtq you know um and so what i also found was that by in a way like by relating to those characters and seeing myself in those characters but never seeing anyone who looked like me i almost started to erase 
the way I looked, my own experience, uh, to the point that I remember when I got out of college, I first started auditioning uh, for acting roles and suddenly, you know, casting directors in LA would be like, hey, can you bring your own turban to the audition? And I'd be like, wait a minute, I'm like barely Indian because I'd spent so much of my time erasing that. And so much of like, I think my adult life has been about coming back into bringing that part of my identity into like, like you said, like not a split place, but into like one whole being. And so that was a big, I was a big impetus for writing this book is like, I didn't, I don't want young people to have to wait till, you know, they're in their late twenties or thirties or forties to say like, oh, I can actually be, be all of, you know, my complex identity. Uh, when in fact at 12 years old, if you see yourself in a book, mm. like, oh yeah, like I can be the lead character of the story too, you know, <laughs> which I think is really important. You know, it's, 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 it's so amazing what you just said, because I remember looking at, you know, looking at television, going to plays, reading books, and the protagonists never looked like me, they never sounded like me, and the characters that were Black were always depictions that I could not relate to, because they weren't drawn from a truth that I was familiar with, you know? Um, and I think, you know, I think that to me really, really resonates is that the truth of who we are as people is quite complex and is not a cardboard cutout. And I think it took me, Malik, probably, it wasn't until I moved to Jamaica in 2016, no, 2013, which was only seven years ago, to where I really felt like I understood what it meant to be a Black person living on the planet because I was able to see myself reflected in a people in a culture that was not dominated by white people or non-black people. So it gave me a chance to sort of understand who I was as a black man on the planet in context of being with other black people on the planet. So all the sort of truths that I held before that totally dissipated, which was really liberating and freeing for me. Yeah. I mean, I had, I had a very similar experience when I remember traveling to India for the first time as a kid. Um, maybe not the first time because we went there when I was very, very young. But it, at, as a kid, when I had like the awareness to, to take in the world around me and seeing billboards with brown people on them and magazine covers with brown people on them. And I was like, oh my gosh, like it was so, it was, you know, that such a strange thing to suddenly feel like, um, like weirdly at home in a place that in so many other levels felt very foreign to me, you know? And I think that's also one of the things that, that you know, kids from other, you know, from backgrounds from other countries just deal with growing up with, where is your actual home? You know, do you, in America, you're always looked at as someone who's sort of, you know, sadly less American than Caucasian people, you know, the way Caucasian people are viewed. And then when we'd go to India, it was so obvious that we were from America, you know, like the way we walk, the way we move, not the way, like I spoke the language badly. And so finding that place that feels like home, but I will say like, I think seeing yourself, uh, just seeing another version of yourself is so important. And there's there's an amazing essay written by this, this incredible woman named Dr. Rudin Sims Bishop. And she's talking specifically about literature for young people. And she talks about mirrors and windows and sliding glass doors. And she, she talks about how, like a book for a young person, um, it can hold up a mirror to their experience. It, can, it might be the first time they see a version of themselves in a story, you know? Um, and it's also a window for um, other young people to understand the experience of, of someone who might have a different background than them. And then at its best, it's a sliding glass door where be, like, this is the power of storytelling, I think, is where you do see yourself in that lead character. So you're literally like opening the sliding glass door and being like, oh, we're moving into each other's worlds. And I think, you know, I think that's how we build empathy. I think that's how we um, start to view people who don't look like us or who don't act like us as human. And you think about the world we're in right now, and it's like, my gosh, we could all use a little more empathy. And like, you know, I, of course, I believe that my views are right, but I also understand that, you know, not to get super political, but, but the country is very divided. You know, there's a, an, uh, like so many people voted for each candidate. And, and it's not going to take divisiveness to bring us together. It's going to take empathy to say, like, why, why are these issues so important to you? And, how, and why are these issues so important to me? And how can we find common ground? Because we have to. We have to. You know, um, I, I write a, a letter for our Pulse magazine every month, which I'll send you after we have this conversation today. 
But I, I talk about in that in the letter for November and December that we need to have a table where everyone can come together and sit at that table and be together. And in, and, and in my world, in my current world, it's the massage table because when a person comes into our spas, we don't ask them, where are you from? We'll ask them where you're from. We don't ask them, you know, are you gay? Are you straight? Who did you vote for in the election? What's your account? You know, we don't, you know, what's your zip code? We don't ask anyone those questions. We ask them, you know, what can we do to make you feel better today? And so there's a great love and empathy that comes across when we do that in our space. And what, and what I love about the book is that it, it, it is an empathetic gesture to every single character in the book, no matter what race they are, no matter their age. I mean, I think when people read the book and the scene where Raul's mom finds out about what happens in the audition and she goes to the bank to get justice for her son, no matter where you come from on the spectrum, that moment is so, it, I, I broke down in tears reading it because everyone has had that moment where they're, where either you are the child or you are the parent and you have to fight for that other person's dignity and humanity and respect. And so I think your book gives that to every single character. And that's what I think is the power of the book is that there's dignity and respect for every single person, every character in that book. Um, that's and to me that's the power of it yeah i so appreciate you saying that so my um my i have a nephew on my husband's side who they're caucasian and and um he's 11 i think he was 11 when the book was coming out and so i sent like a, a, a rough draft of it to him and his mom and i was like will you guys just like give me your input like am i am i like really hitting what it's like to be in middle school you know all of that stuff and so um so uh, my sister-in-law aaron read it with her son and she said that when she got to that chapter she started crying and and her son was like mom are you okay like what's going on and she was like she was like I just know what this moment is like for a mom to only want the best for their kid and to feel like the world is not allowing their kid to have that. And so and I was so moved because I think, again, like that's the power of, I think the specificity because in this moment, Rahul's mom is, you know, standing up to um, people who, who have discriminated against Rahul based on his race, which is not something that Erin has had to do for her son, but she has had to stand up for him. And I think that's, that we can all recognize what it's like to be human in that moment. And, and so anyway, I really appreciate you you saying that. And, and another thing that was important to me too, because you brought up the Brent character, you know, um, who is, you know, we recognize him. We recognize him as this kid who bullies other kids. And, but it was also important to me to give him, um, to give him like a full life as well, because, and I know we're gonna talk about this, but I've done a lot of um, anti-bullying work. And one of the things that we, there's a push towards is like, let's not label kids who bully other kids as bullies because that's labeling them as well. And they are learning this behavior from something, from someone in their lives. And what we want, again, to speak of like the table, bringing people together is to, to believe that we can actually change their behavior, that, that they're not a bully, they're a kid who's bullying for a specific reason. And if we can understand it, if we can talk to them about it, maybe we can change that, you know? Can we talk about act to change? Yeah. I want, to, I want to talk about act to change because there's been so much conversation around bullying really over the past sort of like with social media really sort of taking off over the past 10 to 15 years. And I think bullying has become such a, a really hot topic because it happens in ways that just didn't happen when you and I were in elementary and grade school and junior high. It's, it's much more visceral and real now. But one thing about your mission statement I mean, people should go to acttochange.org to check out the website, it's fantastic. But in your mission statement, you equate healthy communities and healthy lives to anti-bullying, which I thought that's brilliant because if you're afraid, if you are being told that you're less than, and if you're on the receiving end of that or the giving end of that, there's no way that you can be living a healthy existence. And you know, in our world, in the spa world, we talk a lot about physical health. You know, we touch people hands on, we do facials, we do, we, take, we go to the gym, but there's a big part of our business that's about mental health and the health of the environments that we're in. And so when I read that on your website, it really moved me because I felt you, you as an organization get it, that if we're gonna be healthy and whole people, we can't have this thing of bullying 
going on in our communities. So you want to talk about, about your organization? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for um, saying that so beautifully. Um, first of all, just to, just to speak to what, to what you're talking about, you know, we're, so the organization is definitely focused on um, eradicating bullying for Asian American and Pacific Islander youth. And we started as a White House campaign under President Obama. And as you, as you mentioned, I was served on this commission, um, the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Uh, during the Obama-Biden administration. And um, it was an amazing experience. And the commission before me had already started doing work around anti-bullying. And when I got there, I was, you know, growing growing up the way I did and uh, feeling like an outsider and also being on the receiving end of bullying. I was like, this is this is a, a mantle I want to take up. This is something that I feel like I can, I can run with. And so what we did uh, in that commission, we formed the first ever Asian American and Pacific Islander anti-bullying task force at the White House. And then through that task force, which is amazing, it was like five different departments, 25 different people really like coming together to do the work. And we, we did 29 listening sessions around the country, we met with parents, we met with uh, teachers, and of course we met with kids themselves. And we talked about the way bullying was presenting itself. And uh, what we came to learn was that Asian American and Pacific Islander kids are bullied around things that weren't being addressed by other campaigns. So you know, appearance was certainly a thing, but also religion, the food they ate, which is something, you know, you spoke about as well, and um, language, you know, limited English proficiency or accents or uh, perceived immigration status or parents perceived immigration status. So all these things that weren't really being talked about by other campaigns. And then there was a second issue, which was that communities didn't feel comfortable reporting bullying. And part of that was cultural. I think, you know, this idea that uh, if you're an immigrant, just put your head down and do your work. Don't make a lot of noise. Um, I think there was fear around government for some community members. Uh, and so out of this, we formed Act to Change. And Act to Change initially was a White House campaign. Uh, and the idea was to elevate the issue, get people to talk about it, but also get people to report incidents of bullying to the federal government so that we could actually do something about them. And then in 2017, when the White House turned over, there was a lot of anti-Muslim, uh, anti-immigrant rhetoric, and this idea of going out to communities and saying, come back to the federal government with your problems, when the federal government is literally instating you know, policy that is making you feel like you can't trust them, um, just started to feel like there was no way to keep this a White House campaign. So we, myself and a couple former White House staff people, we moved the campaign outside of the White House. Um, it took, you know, those first couple of years were like, wow, you know, like three people on phone calls being like, let's try to make something happen. Let's try to make something happen. But we stuck, our, stuck to it, you know, and now we have an amazing working board of 12 incredible people. We have an advisory council that includes Michelle Lee, the editor of uh, Allure Magazine and Tan France from Queer Eye and Hudson Yang from Fresh Off the Boat and Dr. Vivek Murthy, who is just named to lead uh, Biden's coronavirus task force. And so all these amazing people, and we've gotten to do this incredible work. And, but, but I give you all this background uh, for a specific reason, and that is that the campaign is definitely focused on uplifting Asian American and Pacific Islander youth. But we recognize that you can't lift up one community of young people without lifting up all communities of young people. And you know, we've done a lot of work around um, Black Lives Matter and Black Trans Lives Matter and, and the idea that communities of color, but really all communities have to support each other. So this idea of like what is healthy is not just eradicating bullying uh, for a specific set of kids, but it's literally about like, can we all, like you said, come together at the table and celebrate the things that make us different and actually find common ground in the things that make us seem or feel different. Yeah, you know, we talk up, we we talk a lot about in I Spa that you know, we all want our we all want our hands on the rope. Everyone's hands on the rope. A rising tide lifts raises all boats, lifts all ships. Whatever that whatever that saying is, but you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about? I know you do a lot of work around diversity and inclusion. I know that's uh, another passion of yours besides acting and the act to change. Um, and we are, we're beginning those conversations in our industry um, because there, there, is, there, is a, there is a lot of diversity in the spa industry, believe it or not. People are always sometimes surprised to hear that. And as an organization, iSpa has really been in the forefront of leading that in terms of our policies about how we treat each other and respect each other in the workplace, regardless of your national origin, your race, your sexual identity, your gender identification. Um, 
our latest pulse issue, we put out a whole guideline about how do you avoid mistakes around DNI when you're hiring people. But can you can you talk about your work in that field? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, it really stemmed from the things I dealt with as an actor, which is, you know, that that's actually the culmination of that scene that you're talking about in the book with the mom going to the bank and, you know, Rahul goes to this audition and is basically told like, sorry, you're not white. We don't really need to see your audition. And um, I mean, I dealt with that so much. And I'm I don't know what it was like for you, but I'm sure you felt the same things. I mean, I remember coming out of undergrad and being like, wow, I got to do all these Chekhov plays and like, you know, Ibsen plays and I'm going to get out in the real world and play every part. And then I got to LA, you know, and, and it was like, hey, can you do an Indian accent? And um, literally my first job on television was playing the foreign exchange student at a boarding school. And my character was like in full turban and like dancing and incense was burning and I was feeding, you know, the straight hot white roommate that I'd moved in with, like crazy foods I'd cooked and everything was a joke, like everything was a cultural joke. And so for me, I think in that moment, what I, what I, what that did to me was made me realize that like, if I'm going to be an artist in this world, I've actually got to fight for telling the kinds of stories that, that move the needle forward as opposed to, you know, push us back. And so that's really where my push for like wanting to fight for diversity and inclusion comes from. And so, you know, I've actually spoken at a lot of like corporations and universities around the country. And, and I always bring it back to that specific story for me, which is what have I done as an actor to try to, to try to be conscious of how I'm speaking about diversity and inclusion. And so the other thing that I would just throw out there is, uh, you know, I think we're in a moment right now where there's a lot of rhetoric and, and, and uh, a lot of commitments being made. But I also do think that we're going to have to hold people's feet to the fire. And it's very, very, very encouraging to hear that iSpot has been at like the front of this already and for so long, because I'm also finding uh, um, that when I look at upper levels of management and like studios and networks, and it, there's still so much work to be done. And I, and I feel like there's two sides to this conversation. One is um, we've got to build a pipeline, which I do believe is true. You know, like there, I think for so long, especially like I look at the Asian American or uh, South Asian, you know, culture. And I think not a lot of kids are being encouraged to, you know, be the head of a studio <laughs> or, you know, there, there's still, there's still a disparity there. I, I saw it in government work, you know, it's like being a politician, but not something that people were really pushing their kids to do. But how are we ever going to have, you know, thank God we now have a, a, a vice president who's female and black and Indian, and, you know, cover and biracial and like covering all these things. But but without that representation, I think for so long, people felt like maybe that wasn't open to them. So that's that's for sure true. But I also hear a lot of like, well, we, we can't like make the change just yet because there's no one who's really qualified yet. And I don't buy it. I think there's been so many people who have been looked over and, and, and now's the moment. So I think we really have to hold people's feet to the fire and say like, you can promote from within or you can hire from outside, but we need people at those top levels. And I, and for me as an actor, I think the reason that feels so important to me is, um, you know, we're, we're pitching the best at it now as a, as a TV show, we're trying to turn it into a television show. And when I go into a pitch meeting and I'm sitting with people who don't look like me at all, or don't have the same experience at all, it's not even that they don't want to tell the story but it's like they don't even know the right questions to ask because uh, about how we're going to tell the story because there's no shared experience. And so, yeah, so I have so much to say about this. So the other thing that I was going to say is that I also feel like um, there's a burden put on uh, people of color or people from different backgrounds to have to teach a room full of people who don't look like them or who don't share their perspectives. And all it takes is putting one person on the other side of the table who understands it to relieve such a big part of that burden. So that's why I think those things are, you know, so important. I'm, I'm, I'm taking in everything you're saying because I feel like you're, you're speaking my mind, you're speaking my thoughts through your mouth. Um, and I think that's why, I think that's why your book, I think that's why television and movies and any content is so important because those images matter you know so that if all if all anyone knows of an east indian person is you with a turban on your head serving strange food to someone how are they ever going to really be able to understand you as a three-dimensional full human being and so i think 
those issues of representation in media, those issues of representation in business become critical in terms of this dialogue. And we are in a, we are in a difficult moment um, and it's been long in the making. So we kind of, we've kind of built the house that we're living in right now. But I think, I think the way out is through empathy and understanding and, and, and creating that space for dialogue, for people to have the dialogue and to have the uncomfortable dialogue. It's not always gonna be pleasant conversation, but I, I think those, I think those, those images of, of a black CEO or a Native American judge or whatever those images are become really, really important um, and help people understand the questions to ask. I think so too. And you know, um, just having done so much television, I'm very aware of the fact that, you know, I live in New York, you're out on the West Coast. Like we, there's a lot of diversity around us, but there are large pockets of this country where that doesn't exist. And sometimes someone's first interaction with another culture could be through a television show. And I think about, you know, like right now during this pandemic, I've watched so much television and I started watching like so much foreign television, you know, like Spanish shows and French shows. And, and it is really your entree into this other culture through, through these, you know, fictional stories. So, so what we put in those stories, I think is, um, it's vastly, vastly important. And, and I just want to add to this, like, you know, one thing that I've been talking about a lot and that I've been hearing a lot of um, thought leaders around race and diversity talking about is, uh, is this idea of what it really means to be American. And the idea that uh, I think when we see uh, people who, people of diverse backgrounds and we recognize that they are as American as whatever our preconceived notions of what an American looks like, that's really important because when you think about the real world implications, like post 9-11, you know, pretty much anyone who looked like me uh, was had a target on their back as, as potentially being a terrorist. This idea that like, because your skin is brown, you might be less American than someone whose skin is white. And we also know that like, when we look at domestic terrorism, it's largely done by people who are white. So, so what is that perception that we have in our brains? And then when the coronavirus hit and, uh, and everyone was blaming this virus on China, anyone who looked East Asian or Chinese suddenly had a target on their back and were thought of as less American or somehow, you know, not, you know, not as, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word here, but sort of not as embedded in, in the culture of our country as people who who were white. And so that's a problem because we are all American. And so I think that one of the way we undo those prejudices and those, 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 those perceptions that we have is through um, the visual, is through being able to see people as fully American. So, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, you know we're, we're the one country where, you know, I can become a citizen of France and I'll never be French, <laughs> you know? But when you become an American, you're an American, no matter where you're from, no matter where you were born, no matter how rich or how poor you are. And that's the power of our, of our country, I think, um, and the beauty of it and what makes it so unique. Um, Malik, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you so much for your time today and for talking with me and sharing your wisdom and your point of view on, on your life, on your career, on what you're doing. We're, we're so humbled to have you be a part of this conversation. Um, Thank you so much for having me. This is so, this was, it was so nice to reconnect with you and also hear about the work you're doing and also just to um, be able to talk about these things with, uh, you know, with someone who gets it. I really appreciate it. Thank you and thank you. And to everyone watching, thank you for joining us as well. And keep an eye on the iSpa social media channels and experienceispa.com for details about upcoming installments of our Heart of the Matter series as well as other virtual offerings and spa reopening resources. Stay well and have a wonderful blessed day. Bye everyone.